Welcome to I Rise Conversations with Joan. Welcome to I Rise Conversations with Joan. My name is Joan Wosu, and I'm the award-winning author of the book, I Rise, The 10 Secrets to Getting Up When Life Knocks You Down. So as a Black woman and an immigrant from Nigeria now living in Canada, I'm very, very familiar with some of the systemic barriers and challenges that we have to face both at work and just in the society at large. The journey to leadership positions is a difficult battle where very, very few of us succeed and others are so discouraged they don't even try. This class ceiling still exists, even with all the diversity and inclusion programs becoming the new buzzwords and many organizations claiming to be more inclusive and equitable. But are they really doing enough? Has the needle actually shifted? Or are there things that we as immigrants can do personally to empower and support ourselves on the journey to the top? Well, these are some of the things that we're going to be discussing with my amazing guest today, Dr. Marisol Capijan. She is the founder and director of Transformational Coaching Certifications at the Capijan Institute. She is an internationally recognized and award-winning educator, a coach, a TEDx speaker, a former lecturer at the University of Miami, a leadership and diversity, equity and inclusion speaker, trainer, and an executive coach. As an Afro-Latina mother and immigrant, she has faced and witnessed many of the institutional and systemic barriers and biases that Black women face in the career trajectory to leadership roles, which sparked her passion for women's empowerment and the need to increase the representation of women in positions of power. She's currently writing a book, Leadership is a Responsibility, and in addition, her personal story of resilience has been featured on CNN, where she discusses how her mindset helped her overcome homelessness at 17. Welcome, Dr. Marisol, to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited <laughs> for yeah. joining you in to join you in this space. Mm -hmm. um, and I just have to say, I did a 23 and me at one point in my life. And my ancestors are from Nigeria no in way. Ghana. No <laughs> yes. Amazing. So when you said that, I was like, I have to say it. So actually, <laughs> you know, in my quest to finding myself and everything mm -hmm. and knowing about my past, um, I found out that my ancestor came in the transatlantic slave trade and they were transported to Dominican Republic. So I'm Dominican, I know Spanish, I grew up as a Dominican, yeah. but that's where I come from. So when you said that, I was like, okay, ah, we're going to connect. I mean, that's what we look a little bit alike, yeah. I, I can see yes. the resemblance. <laughs> yes, for sure. That's amazing, it's awesome to have you here. Thank you for being here with us. So tell us a little bit about yourself, because I know now you've mentioned that you're an immigrant, so tell us a bit about your background. How was it growing up? Where did you grow up before you eventually um, immigrated to the U.S.? So I grew up, I grew up in the Dominican Republic and I grew up with my grandmother. So my mother didn't take care of me. Um, actually, it's like a, a whole back story about like me being with somebody else and my father getting me and bringing me back to my grandmother uh, hopefully like all alive and fine. <laughs> and then my grandmother actually took me in and she had five kids, a single mother of five, and I became her sixth. Mm -hmm. And I grew up very poor. So we had to shine shoes. Uh, we had to uh, clean houses, take care of kids. Uh, we used to do ice cream and sell like little bags of ice cream to the people in the neighborhood. Then I remember stories of my grandmother saying like one time she bought a TV and then she would charge people to, to watch TV in the room because she was one of the only pe first people in the neighborhood with a TV. So I grew up very, 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 very poor. Um, my, and I was there and I met my mother later on. And when I met my mother, she one of the things that she wanted to do to better my life was to bring me to the United States. So I came to the United States seeking opportunity. And when I came to the United States, after four months of living with my mom, for one reason or the other, I ended up being homeless. And when I was homeless, um, I had to you know, make a decision. Do I stay in the United States 
do I go back to the Dominican Republic? I had no family, like I had no support systems in, in the United States. So now I'm 17 and I'm by myself in the US wow. and I'm sleeping in people's couches. I'm asking people like, bring me food. I'm like it, working in McDonald's, making sandwiches, like trying to survive. As an immigrant, imagine going to another country with nobody. But when you grow up poor, when all you know is poverty and you know like how is it to not have to not have any electricity or water. Um, one of the things that you may hear is in order for you to make it in the world, you have to get an education. Yes. Yeah. My grandmother will be like, that's the solution to poverty. <laughs> get an education. Now in the US, you know, you're going to get in a lot of loans if you don't have mommy and daddy paying for that degree, right? If you don't have scholarships. Um, so I'm here and even though I'm sleeping in people's houses and, and I was sleeping on the floor at one time for two years, um, I never ceased going to school. So I went to school no matter what. And when I went to school, graduated with honors, and then I went for my master's degree and then my doctoral degree. And I became the first person in my family with a master's and a doctoral degree. Wow. Um, this is where the leadership journey comes in because here I am coming from nothing yes. thinking, well, I'm going to do what I have to do. We tell black women, we tell a lot of minority women that if you go ahead and you perform and you get your education and you excel expectations, you're going to have the same chance as everyone else to move up the ladder and make a career for you. Mm -hmm. And I found out that that wasn't the case, that it doesn't matter sometimes. And I know it's going to sound so bad. I don't want to discourage anyone from getting a degree. But unless we fix systemic issues that prevent Black women from achieving parity mm -hmm. in the workplace, you may have a lot of people like me that are walking around with credentials, with preparations, with everything, and are not having the opportunity to show their potential in the workplace just because they look like me or just because of their gender or just because they have a disability. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, there are a lot of implicit biases in the workplace and microaggression and discrimination that prevent minority women from achieving positions of power. So... Yes. I don't know, I don't know, I think it's okay. So before we get into, because yes. I'm hearing words that I, yeah, microaggression. Yes. I can talk for days about that, but just going back to 17, your whole, and I'm sorry, it didn't work out with your mom, but 17 homeless, not having any family, but you kept going to, to school. You went through, got an education. Like, how did you even do that? A lot of people for them, that's it. It's like, well, life has dealt me the worst cards in the world. So I'm just going to be a bum and do nothing with my life. What mindset, what kept you going? So that's a great question because every time I look back and I ask myself that question, I, two things are re that were very, very crucial in my development. So one of them was that I didn't have a plan B. Hmm. Wow. I had to get my education. Like that was non-negotiable. Okay. And I feel like sometimes we negotiate with our goals, right? And you have to stop negotiating with your goals. Like for me, well, okay, maybe I didn't negotiate uh, with going to school because I came from poverty, because I knew how bad it was. Um, and something that I didn't say before, before I came to the US and something that led me to come here was because when I was 15, I, I got pregnant and it wasn't a good situation. So I was an adolescent pregnant. And when that happened, coming from a family that is very strict and it's about like, you have to wait until you get married. Yes. Yes. So my family is like that. I felt at that point that I was like the shame of my family in a way, because how could I, even though I had no fault, the person was much older than me. Right. Mm -hmm. But we tend to uh, tell women that they are at fault, even when they're being abuse or even when they're facing domestic violence it's something that I notice even now yeah. so I remember like the shame was on me when the shame should have been in the person that you know perpetrated that so I lost uh, I I had an, an unfortunate circumstance and I lost um the pregnancy and then 
I just felt like I felt, I didn't want to feel like that again. I wanted to make something of myself. I wanted to come here, make it happen. Yeah. And when I was here, since I had gone through all of that and coming from poverty and not knowing my mother for many years, there was a lot of, I guess, I didn't want to go back to that. So for me, in order for me to not go back to that, my goals couldn't be negotiable hmm. and I feel like when you have a lot of comfort in your life your goals become negotiable my goals were negotiable for me because not meeting my goal of going to school will lead I'm going back to poverty and I'm going back to you know dealing with my family after that <laughs> happened, right yeah. so for me it was like either I make it <laughs> or I make it exactly. so that was one thing it's like not negotiating on your goals and I, that's something that I had to work on afterwards because i think when you start getting comfortable you start looking for excuses like yes i'm gonna try to make it as an entrepreneur but if that doesn't happen i have a plan b yeah. and i feel like if you have a goal you have to go you have to go all in you cannot go you cannot meet a goal when you're half committed yeah. I was all in. So it didn't matter if I didn't sleep well one night because I didn't have a place to stay. It didn't matter if I didn't eat. Of course, some people will say, well, don't encourage that. I'm not encouraging you to do that. You can go eat. But I was saying in my case, my personal case, for me, it didn't matter because my my goal was to get an education. And I think we should be like that with self-care. We should be like that with building, our rela building relationship with other people. We should have integrity with ourselves mm -hmm. and bet on ourselves we yeah. bet on other people we don't bet on ourselves and i <laughs> bet on myself that i was going to finish my education yeah. oh, so I, that was one thing i i love it and honestly that's such a good lesson i'm a big fan of think and grow rich uh, by napoleon hill and those are some of the things that he really teaches like really really you have to the burning desire for your goal and have no plan b this mm -hmm. is it. I'm going to do it regardless. Mm -hmm. There's no, oh, I can cop out. There's no copying out. Mm -hmm. You can stay true to your goals and just focus and finish it. Mm -hmm. And again, for you, it, you had a very, very strong why. A lot of people do things because they don't even know why they're doing it. It's like, oh, it sounds cool. And then tomorrow it's not cool anymore. So I'm out. Mm -hmm. Have a strong why. Like, no, no, you why, had... are you doing it? Mm -hmm. why are you doing it? You were clear. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back. So that kept you going. So mm -hmm. for anyone who's sitting on the fence or thinking, oh, I want to do this, but I'm not sure. Go back to your why. Why do you want to do it? And once you're sure that this is a goal that you want to focus on, burn the bridges. Like there's no, there's no shift. There's no plan B. Go for it. Give it yeah, all. Go for it. Give it and all. And then the other thing that helped me was my mindset. My mindset was, aside from having not plan B, yeah. uh, my mindset was always, I, I, I remember going to school and meeting other kids while I be, I'm sleeping on the floor in somebody else's house. I will meet other kids that had mommy and daddy, comfort, not a worry in the world. Yeah. Sometimes they're in for the school. They have a car to get to school. I didn't have a car. I had to take buses, hours to go to school. And they will always find something to complain about. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am with nothing. And I'm showing up with a huge smile on my face saying, I'm going to, I am going to finish school top of my class. I'm going to do this. And I had the just mindset that I could, and that it was possible if I just wanted to dive into it. Yeah. Um, and I think that goes to this, not having a plan B and then and trying your best to not be hard on yourself and just trust it while you're doing it yeah. just remind yourself that you are strong enough to make it happen yeah oh I, I love that that resilience but even at such a young age that is so phenomenal okay so now let's go back now to black women and black people or you know new immigrants marginalized people trying to rise up in, in the ladder in the corporate ladder I know you had mentioned that it well, the older folks, like our parents and all, they did preach to us, get an education. That's all you need. And all the doors will open. But we found that even with education, you still have people who even have PhDs driving Uber. You know, they just can't get in. They just can't break in, especially as an immigrant. So what are some of the things that you experience in the corporate world? And how did that impact you on your journey to the top? So one of the things that um, happened, so First of all, I'm a huge believer based on my 
background that if I put my mind into something, it's going to happen, right? So here I am, like I'm waking up at 4 a.m. and like reading books and doing Tony Robbins and yeah. like, all of these things of personal development. Yeah, 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 Stephen Covey and Brian Tracy and time management and discipline. Like I've read everything. I became a coach. I even became a coach, a certified coach by uh, after I started reading about all these things, I got immersed in the world. So I'm doing this while I'm trying to move up in my career. And I still feel like what what is happening? How come there's people that don't look like me, doesn't have some of the credentials that I have, but opportunities are thrown at them. And they may sometimes not even show up as much as I'm showing up, but they are given like the opportunity to move up. And when I started doing my dissertation, my dissertation for my doctoral degree was about women's trajectory to leadership positions. And I started looking that, you know, women have been graduating more than men in the United States with bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree. So we have more women than men that are educated in the workforce. However, when you look at Fortune 500 companies, we're only percent of CEOs. But if you look at black women, we're less than 2%. So I started looking, so all of this gender parity talk, the people that have been able to break it to the top or break the glass ceiling are usually white women. Yeah. <laughs> because when you look at the numbers, yeah. you don't see Afro-Latinas that much, or you don't see Latinas, you don't see minority women. So I said, what's going on here? So I started looking at numbers. I started interviewing women. And, you know, there is a lot of things that we go through as women generally, mm -hmm. but there are a lot, some things that as a black woman, a Latina woman, we have more challenges in the workplace because as you have more intersection of identities, you have more, usually have more challenges. So we have gender bias where, you know, people don't consider you for roles because you're a woman or they want to give you administrative work because <laughs> you're a woman or you're the one who's going to make copies and bring coffee, right? Yeah. Because you're a woman. But then I know it's disgusting. But then you have, when you're a black woman, you're not supposed to speak up. Yeah. You speak up and all of a sudden you're angry and difficult. Aggressive. Why are you so aggressive? Why are you so aggressive? Yeah. And that is something that I didn't see from my colleagues and other people that I met. I had a, a, a an instance in my career where I was working alongside somebody else and she would call me her assistant. I was like, but I'm not her assistant. And I'm like, I didn't know the repercussion that would come from me speaking up against that. Because now like, I'm an immigrant and I believe like, <laughs> You know, I'm not exposed to that type of environment. This is the first time. And I was, every time I went to a hotel, oh, Marisol, my assistant, I was like, I'm a faculty just like you. I teach just like you. Why are you calling me your assistant? And in the minute I pick, speak up, you know, I, rem I, I remember being like, I wasn't invited to other meetings, like things like that started happening in my career. So about having negative consequences for speaking up, or not allowing somebody to discriminate you or treat you badly. And I think that's something that happens more to black women than yeah. to other women or Afro-Latinas. So there is this, this mentality that you're here because we're good enough to let you be in here. Not you're here because you are good enough, because you made it, because you are hard hardworking. And I'm not saying for everyone, I don't want to generalize. There are probably a lot of great bosses out there who doesn't don't do that. But generally that happens to black women and there was another scientist a professor who coined the term pet to threat that happens to black women specifically that when you join an organization usually you know you get treated like a little child like we're helping you and <laughs> everybody's so happy that you're here yeah, me, yes go here and let's give her that and she's gonna help us with that and she's great <laughs> but then the minute you start gaining confidence and you want to be respected like everyone else then you become a threat and now you're ungrateful because who do you think you are trying to get the same respect at us? And that is called the pet to threat phenomenon that somebody else who coined the term. Um, but things like that, I started figuring out, I was like, is this what's happening to me? Did I just become a threat? 
Uh, but it was very interesting because then you realize that the lack of women in leadership positions or the black, lack of black women in leadership positions have nothing to do with lack of confidence. Like we tell women, oh, you just have to gain confidence and let go of the imposter syndrome. I'm like, I don't remember meeting a black woman who wasn't confident. <laughs> I don't remember meeting a black woman who wasn't confident. Like there is no lack of confidence, at least of the person that I met. Yeah. It's not a lack of confidence. There may be some instances of the lack of confidence settings, but what I'm saying is stop putting it on the minority that we're not there because something is wrong with us. Oof. Something is wrong with the system. Yeah, and let's stop telling us, gain confidence, buy a career development book. Like all of those things are great. Get a sponsor. Get a sponsor. Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. But why do we need a sponsor? We need a sponsor because the system is broken. Yes. If the system wasn't broken, we wouldn't need a sponsor. We would be able to move to the top based on our potential and our performance. Sorry, I just went on. <laughs> <laughs> but it is so true. And honestly, like I experienced everything you're talking about, you know, the same microaggression. They treat you like, oh, you know, we're doing you a favor. Come, come, come into the fall. You know, and I went through that phase as well, where my boss would introduce me as, oh, this is the new her, whatever her name is. I'm like, no, I'm not the new you. I'm me. Like, what? what like, no, we're different. Mm -hmm. and, you know, oh, she's going to learn. She's going to be just like me. No, I'm going to do me. I'm going to, I, I have what I bring to the, to the organization. But like you said, the moment you start really showing up as yourself and trying to show that this is what I bring, then everyone's threatened. Everyone's uncomfortable. Oh, why are you so difficult? Oh, you're pushing us. Oh, you're so aggressive. And then, like you said, we start thinking that there's something wrong with us. Mm -hmm. We start Oh, that is so painful. It, it, you, you go through this over and over again. You find women or Black women who are now broken, who now second-guess themselves. Because like you're saying, most of us, we're naturally confident. Mm -hmm. We're naturally good at learning and being able to articulate ourselves. But when you've been in a system that is so broken, it can break you. Mm -hmm. and that's what I think we really need to, we need to stay strong. We need to know that we're not broken. The system is broken. That is the problem. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with you. Mm -hmm. You know, keep showing up as who you are. It's not you. Mm -hmm. but yeah, but it's like you said, it's very hard. I really very hard. had to work on my mindset while I was going through hardships at my job. Because I said to myself, this is not really happening. Yeah. Is this really happening? Like, this is the mentor. This is the person that I admire. Like, did she just turn on me? Like, you just get this shock. Oh, yeah. Of, like, you, you start blaming yourself because you think to yourself, like, how come you didn't, I didn't see this before? Yeah. Am I wrong? Like, you start questioning yourself, questioning your abilities. Yeah. I had to get a lot of coaching to not get that trauma impact me personally because it was very hard. And you know what the hardest thing was when I was facing this at work was seeing how the people that supposedly were so supportive of me were so quiet. Oh, yes. <laughs> while this was happening. Yeah. Like, I think nothing prepared me for that. Because you might think, okay, so I'm having this difficulty with this person, but all of you know me for years. Yeah. And everybody just stay away. Like, I don't even want to be a part of this. And I'm like, but you used to come to my diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops. <laughs> yeah. You keep posting on, on Black History Month about how it's important to promote Black women. You are always talking about the need for representation. And this is happening in your face. Mm -hmm. And you're not doing anything about it. I think that was the most heartbreaking thing to me. Because then you understand, okay, so this is systemic. And all of them know what's going on and nobody is willing to step up. Yes. Because everyone's afraid. You know, you don't want to step up and then now I'm going to be fired because I'm trying to protect. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> the funny thing like... is when I worked in academia is that actually there is tenure, right? And tenure is where your job is secured for years. So you had people that had tenure that looked at this going on. They were not going to lose their job. Wow. But still... And still didn't speak up, still didn't check, and still didn't like, okay, let's see what's going on with this minority faculty and what's going to her, what's going on with her, right? So I think when, when you're talking about Black women in the workplace, um, if you're not having a, a great time in the workplace, right, if you have the personal, you know, shock that you get from when this is happening to you, the questioning yourself, 
and then realizing that whoever you thought was your friend or most of the people that you thought were your friend were not actually your friend. And some people, I would even say that, are glad that this is happening to you because, you know, they thought you were too much or they thought, you know, somebody's putting you in your place, right? But will they do the same thing if it was a young white male? I mean, you know, it's, it's different. Yes, and I don't want to put everybody in a box. I don't want to generalize. Hmm? Uh, yeah, but but it is what it is. It's the reality of, of the world that we live in. And some people are not even aware. They don't even know. It's unconscious. They don't even know that they're doing this. So I think it's necessary to call out not just people who might be doing it unconsciously, but also for other people who are seeing other people go through it and being silent. Mm -hmm. I think the movement involves all of us. We should be able to speak up when mm -hmm. we see such things happening, not just be silent and be like, oh, that's not my problem. You know, that's mm -hmm. her problem to deal with. Because I think we, we have to tackle this as a collective. Mm -hmm. else people would just break and just go sit in a corner and not even aspire to be anything or do anything. Because mm -hmm. this is challenging. Don't post about the importance of equity. <laughs> <laughs> stop posting about it. Like stop with it. Like I think the performative thing was the 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 that the thing that really got me. Yeah. Because I'm like, you posted so much about this. Yeah. Yeah. And you're letting you you're seeing this happening. And for a black woman out there, if you're having a tough time. One of the best advice I received, and I didn't know how to comp com how to apply it at the moment, but now I guess I'm on the other side of having my, uh, you know, being able to like reclaim myself, yeah. is not lose yourself in the process because very easily you you work very hard and you believe in yourself, and then this is happening and you start questioning your abilities, yeah. and you start questioning like what's the meaning? Why am I going to go through this if? You know, I'm a, I may work very hard and this may happen. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm writing the book, Leadership is a Responsibility, which is about the responsibility of the leader. We have a problem with diversity, equity, and inclusion because the leaders at the top are stopping the progress, are not creating a culture of inclusion. We stop, we have to stop relying on the minority to educate the privileged people how to treat yes. us, right? the leader has to take the charge hmm. on making sure that we have a culture of inclusion, not the minority. Yeah. And sometimes that can take a huge mental toll on us, some, uh, you know, in certain cases, because you're relieving the trauma. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> interesting times are ahead. So I, I really love what you said, you know, just to encourage people that might be going through a rough time, do not lose yourself through this process because it's very easy to uh, so what kind of support can people get because I know you were mentioning that when you're going through this most times you don't even have any support there's people you thought were your friends they're like mm, um say what now mm -hmm. so how can people who maybe are not as strong to be resilient and stay and hold on what are some of the practical steps that they can take to either help themselves or to get the support to keep them going so I think looking back one thing that I will you always have the chance if you can, to go to another environment, because I feel like it's very depleting and it's very hard. Like I went through that for, uh, I went through a lot of challenges for a couple of, like almost a year, like one after the other, or almost two years basically. And it was very depleting, it was very depleting, it was depleting my energy. Um, it was very abusive. And I feel that looking back, if you're going through that, just know that there are companies and people out there that will be glad to have you. I interviewed some women for my book and some of these women said, I left and then the promotion I longed for in so many years at my old job, they gave it to me in two months in this new job. So sometimes mm. if, if you're not wanted in a space and it's clear to you, move to another space. Why is that? I think that one of the things that happened to me is that for me, I couldn't comprehend that this was real. So I couldn't accept that this was my reality. Yeah. And I feel like the faster you accept that sometimes you're dealing with a racist person, the faster you're going to get away from it or you're going to find a way to cope with it. But if you're in this denial mode, mm -hmm. it's harder. It's harder to deal with it because you're in denial. Yeah. You're like, but how could she do this to me? Yeah. And some people are very good at masking who they really are. Mm -hmm. And our mind will like try to protect us. It's like, no, no. And it's like, no, I wish I, I earlier I could have just stayed to myself. This is happening. This is real. 
get out of this situation. But if you're like me and you're fighting the fight, <laughs> because I did fight the fight, uh, just document everything. I think you have to document things for two reasons. So you have to document things because you want to have proof of what happened because a lot of these biases and microaggression and things like that, you don't want this to be a, a she say or her say. Mm -hmm. You want to be like, this happened. Fact, yeah. Here it is. Because people will see what happens in front of you and say, well, maybe you're making it up in your mind. They're yeah. like, okay. <laughs> That's not really what, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here it is. And then the next thing is, you kind of have to detach yourself from the situation and say, I am reporting this or I'm going through this, but this doesn't define me. I am who I am and I'm worthy and I'm dealing with a situation that is external. And I think that really helps. Mm. Oh, I like that. D mm -hmm. Detaching yourself. The from... outcome of that doesn't yeah. define me. Oh, okay. So the mm -hmm. outcome doesn't define you. I, I like that because it's so easy to just get in and then you're not sleeping at night. You're constantly thinking about it. You're constantly just wondering what happened. Is it me? Is it them? What's going to happen? But you're saying just detach yourself. It doesn't change who you are. Whatever the outcome is, it's fine. You are who you are and you're worthy. I, I, mm -hmm. I, Do self-care. Don't lose self yourself in the process. And then and... Move, leave. If it's not working, just leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Else. Yeah. I, I try to be very careful when I tell people like, you know, just get another job because we know sometimes it's very hard for us. Yes. Especially like you have kids. Like at that point, I have two small children and my husband was uh, recently diagnosed with cancer when that happened. And I was in the middle of like, a, like of going through all of that at the same time. Wow. And it was very hard because I was just like, oh my God, my, my world is falling apart. And my husband, I don't know if he's going to be alive. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to be a single mom? And also, I mean, lose my husband in the process and lose my job at the same time. So it's very hard sometimes. Um, and when you have a job sometimes and you feel you like, I feel, I love teaching and I love what I was doing. Like my whole identity was attached to my job, which I think is a mistake sometimes that we do. <laughs> that, you know, our job becomes our identity. Yeah. And then something happens with your job and you're just like, oh, like what? <laughs> who am I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So thank you. Thank you so much. I think those are really, really key practical steps that people can take today to, to not lose themselves, move, get a new job, and really just make sure that you always remind yourself that you are worthy. The situation does not define who you are. So tell us a little bit more about this book. So I know that you're saying that the book is targeted at leadership, but how helpful will it be for people who are not leaders yet, but are aspiring to be leaders in the workplace and are going through some of these systemic issues that we're discussing today? So the book is divided into three parts. So the, the, the title of the book is Leadership is a Responsibility because the focus is to really understand that the situation that we're in is because of the leaders that we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of leaders that have positions right now, they have those positions because they were very good at their jobs. And then it was the logical next step to become a manager or a leader. But you being good at your job doesn't mean that you are a good leader. Leadership is totally different. That you, you need different skills to be a leader. Um, and that's usually something that happens in corporation. We have to stop doing that. You may have somebody who's not very technical and a very good individual contributor, but they're very good with people and getting people together and they're, you know, they foster a good environment. So talking about leadership, part one of the book is about women in leadership, how the experience is a woman in the workplace. And I have two chapters that are dedicated to black women and Afro-Latinas. Because okay. many times we read book about women in leadership and we just assume that the same experiences that white women go through is the same experience as a black woman. And I'm like, no, there is a distinction and we need to talk about this, right? For example, some of the leaders that I interviewed that were um, Afro-Latinas, they talk about having an accent and how people just assume that because you have an accent, you don't know what you're talking about. Those are very different experiences, right? Um, so part, part one of the book is women in leadership and then the chapter for black women and a chapter for Afro-Latinas. The second part of the book is my own case study of how I went through an ordeal in academia that led to a workplace investigation that ended up in me losing my job. 
So all of that is in the second part of the book. And I talk about, you know, the trauma, the the mental trauma you go through, workplace trauma, racial trauma, and all of that. And that is just to basically give a glimpse to women of like the kind of things or the signs that sometimes I just didn't see, but they were there because looking back, you're like, huh, that's why they gave me the position, but didn't give me the the, the the authority or the budget because they were just using me to have my picture and tell people that they were diverse. diverse. I think we, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So you start looking like the signs, right? And then part three is about career development tips for women and black women in the workplace. So advice from other black women about how to succeed in the, in the workplace and then advice for leaders. So if you're a leader in 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 a corporation or an institution, how do you make your workplace more inclusive? Oh, love it. So it's something for everyone. So whether you're already an existing leader or you aspire to be a leader, there's something in it for there. And I think it's just it would just be amazing to read your own personal story and to think that after all that happened to you, you still got fired and you're still here today encouraging people, empowering people. It just shows, again, just back to what you were saying about that resilience, you know, knowing who you are, knowing what your why is, and just pushing forward. What advice do you have for women who now maybe have been fired? And I do have someone like that who was fired from a job and just hasn't had the confidence to go back to the workplace, hasn't hasn't applied, really. Mm-hmm. She's just given up. She's like, I'm scared. What advice would you have for people who are at that stage where maybe they went through what you went through as well? I will say the first thing is that it is okay to be scared. I mean, after you go through abuse or you go through discrimination, mm-hmm. it's hard and you have to allow yourself to heal. And it's okay to take some time to heal. Um, and, and after you go into the workplace, I think one of the things that you have to do is understand that that's a job. And I think that's something that didn't register in my mind. For me, my job was everything. My career was everything, especially like coming from where I come from and not having any support system and everything. I built a, like a whole support system at my job. I was very invested with my career. I was paying out of pocket with like professional development things that looking back, I was like, how come she's getting paid for that? And I'm, they're not me, right? And I'm like, looking back, I'm like, no, your company should pay for your own professional development don't take it out of your own money of course if you want to you can do it but looking back i'll be like there's certain things that will have changed right and i will say when you go back just do what you love and just after you finish your job remember that you have a life right i remember i think we're conditioned to work 24 7 because we want to prove ourselves <laughs> and i was the person who woke up at 6 a.m in grading papers and making sure my lectures were fine and making sure that you know the the students love me and that they're having fun and students will send me emails at 8 p.m i used to meet with my students i think i was the only professor that will meet with 250 students per semester individually no. this is how oh. devoted i was wow. my, to my job I was like, I am going to meet with every single student. I'm going to know their stories. I'm going to know who they are. I'm going to make sure that I know who's in my classroom. And that, you know, if you have a student who is like hesitant about learning or something that I give them support. This is how dedicated I was with my job. Um, And and I would just say, yeah, it's good to be dedicated. But if things don't work out, you still like, you still have in your mind that this was just a job. And it's sad to sometimes to think that way because you want to make a career, but I feel like now a, a, a job or a career should be both ways. If I'm going to give my best and I'm going to be that into my job, what are you going to do for me? And I feel like that is something that was on unba- not balanced. I was giving mm-hmm. a lot. I was giving a lot. I was giving a lot. Mm-hmm. And then there were the signs that they were not respecting my contributions. And then I was like, oh, they will see, like, they will see how good I am, you know? And I feel like if you want to go back into the workforce, I feel like you should see your job as a two-way street. Mm-hmm. And that is also when you go and interview. Sometimes we go to interview and they're asking all the questions. And I'm like, now I interview and I'm like, tell me about the role. <laughs> 
Why are you hiring somebody? <laughs> exactly. What happened with the person that just left? Like, I need to know what I'm getting into. Yeah. Not going into it all blindly, mm -hmm. hoping that things will work out. And I will need to know the career development plan. Where do I see myself in three years? What do I have to do to get, like, can I get it in writing? <laughs> like, I feel like we shouldn't be afraid of that because sometimes I meet people that they do it this way, but we are conditioned that things, I feel like there should be less guessing and mm -hmm. more, let's all be in the, in the same page. Not saying that you're difficult or anything like that. It's just a normal question. Like who's going to be my manager and what's their management style and what is it that you need me to do? What does it mean when I give a hundred percent? What are you performing? Like I am also interviewing you to see if you're good for me. Yeah. And I think that's something that we have to learn how to do. I think that is something that we definitely need to learn how to do because that is not the norm. The norm is I'm here. I'm desperate for a job. I'm begging you, please, please hire me, please hire me. And we're not really asking the right questions, but you're right. When you interview from that point of view, it's from an empowered point of view. So they respect you and they're like, oh, okay. So, all right. Oh, she knows what she's doing. You know, she's not going to come here and be a doormat for anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I think that's a good way for, for black women or black people, marginalized people when we're going into the workforce, because that's the beginning, right? The interview. So it's from relationship. That, yeah, that's where it starts. So that's a good point to start to really put your foot down and just ask the right questions so that it's a two-way street. It's not you just giving, giving and burning out, trying to impress and still you're not getting the results or the promotion that you deserve. Mm -hmm. It's like dating, right? If you're like you, if, if you have a relationship and you know, you have the five love languages, if you ever read the book, right? <laughs> that people love in different languages. Yes. If your husband loves by words of affirmation you can give your husband as many gifts as you want because that's the way you show love by giving yeah. they will not capture that this is love because they love by words of affirmation and i think as a minority woman sometimes we are taught that we have to give 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 take care give 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 so that people will appreciate us yes. and sometimes it's not that way sometimes it's let me ask my future manager, what does she or he values? What do you value? Mm -hmm. Or oh, I value people that come in early. I value people that give their best. What does it mean to give your best? Yeah. Give me clear like instruction of what does it mean? And then let's have a conversation. That doesn't mean that you have a chip on your shoulder. That doesn't mean that you're being confrontational. That means like we are on the same page and that allows for less miscommunication. Yeah. Uh, absolutely yeah oh i love it uh, sorry i hope my, my listeners i hope you're getting some of these tips because we're getting to the top we are going to get those leadership roles <laughs> uh, we're going to do whatever we're going to play, play our own part the things that we can do but again just like we said in the beginning it's up to all of us if you see some of this injustices you know happening in the workplace speak up don't just be silent, especially if you're in a leadership role and you see these things happening to minority people. Speak up as well. We need to work together and help each other out and support each other. But, you know, for the individual, it also starts with you. Believe in yourself. Don't lose yourself. Know who you are. Know that you're worthy when you step up to these organizations or when you go for interviews and really stay true to who you are. Don't feel like, oh, you know, because you don't have the support or I need to make myself small or I'm aggressive or you second doubt yourself. No, stay strong. There's nothing wrong with you. You haven't done anything wrong. Just stay strong and keep fighting the fight. Oh, there's a fight in the fight with you as well. And we will overcome. I think the needle is shifting, but not as quickly as an, enough because by the numbers, we can see that it's not really shifting a lot. But I know that eventually over time, if more and more of us who are in leadership roles keep helping the other people come into leadership positions, speaking up when we see some of these things happening, then I think that there's hope for, for, for minorities for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah and like you said i think it should move much faster yeah. but we should do a collective effort absolutely wow awesome mm -hmm. thank you so much dr marisol for being here with us today uh lots of things to think about lots of encouragement for people who maybe are going through some of this or maybe you've gone through it in the past and it has made you feel like you're inadequate now you know that a lot of minority women go through exactly the same thing. Like everything you were saying, I could resonate with it and we're in different countries. So it's very common. It's more common than you think. Maybe we're not speaking about it enough, but it is common and there is support. 
You know, if anyone needs support, there are people out there who are fighting this fight. Don't sit back or go hide in a corner and say, oh, I give up. No, we moved to these countries for a reason and we're going to achieve them. You know, we're going to keep We're fighting. tough. We're tough. We're going to be resilient and we're going to keep fighting it. But don't mm -hmm. feel like you're alone. Keep at it. Keep striving. Keep trying to break that glass ceiling. It will break. Mm -hmm. Well, I say sometimes it's like a cement ceiling. I'm like, stop <laughs> calling it glass ceiling. Like because... <laughs> It's, it's yeah they call a glass ceiling like it's so easy to break i'm like it's not like that you know how much of how much i tried to keep my job and i was like this is it feels like a cement so from now on i call it a cement, the cement ceiling. ceiling oh yeah. i love that the cement ceiling but cement does break and we will break through yeah. it you have to get like a tool but it does exactly it does break thank you so much for being here with us today it was truly truly a pleasure Thank you for having me here. I love this yes. conversation. And I would love to read your book when it comes out. So I'll be I'll be looking out for that one. Yes. Thank sir. you. Thank, Thank you for having me. Uh, and just so you know, we do have the pre-sale is now open. Awesome. And then if you get the pre-sale of the book, if you pre-order the book, your name will be shown in the acknowledgement sections of the book. So there are packages about like having your name there and things like that, that I'm trying to, so that I can sell 200 copies. That's the goal, to sell 200 copies so that it can fund the publishing. So wow. that's also available. Oh, that's great. Okay. So I'll be sure to put the, the link to the website in the show notes so that people who are interested can sign up. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. And thank you to all my amazing listeners, to all my minority people trying to break through that cement ceiling. We will get there. Thank you for listening. And I will see you same time next week on iRise Conversations with Joan. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.